Hi, I'm Jessica Brillhart. I work at uh, Google. I'm the, they gave me this title this week, but I'm the principal filmmaker for VR at Google. Um, so hi, how's it going? Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, sort of the state of VR. I'm not, I'm not a designer, I'm a filmmaker, but a lot of the stuff that I do is generally about design, and design is actually very huge in the VR space. Um, I think Ken's going to be doing the, the wrap-up of, uh, of the conference, and he's also really been thinking about a lot of this stuff, so he'll be talking more about designing specifically in the VR space. Uh, so yeah, anyway, that's me. Um, so I work with a team that does something called Jump, which uh, this will all make sense soon, but it's, the, it's a 360 uh, stereoscopic rig. Uh, it's software that stitches all the cameras from that rig together into one seamless experience. Um, and then it's support on YouTube. So recently we announced that we would support um, stereoscopic uh, 360 content on YouTube so anyone in the world can see it, which is huge, as long as you have cardboard and Android phone. We're working on iOS, that will be a thing, but for now it's uh, Android. So this is the state of my life currently. I don't know if this is going to play. But basically, he's supposed to be moving and putting down tracks on this as he's going down the track. But I guess it's not playing. But anyway, uh, that's my life, and that's the state of VR. We're all kind of running very quickly at things, um, and we're kind of laying down the tracks as we go. We're like, this is great. And then we're just sort of like rebuilding, reinventing the wheel every time, which makes, uh, it makes everything very exciting, but it makes making presentations like incredibly frustrating and difficult. So. Bear with me, it's all going to be what it is now, and it'll probably change tomorrow or the next day or the next week or whatever. Anyway, so the landscape. So I'm going to talk really quickly about the, the, like, uh, the gear, the gear talk. Um, and uh, there are two real ranges to, to VR currently. There's the cinematic, and then there's the positional. So one is you can move around and walk around, and that's how you, how you experience the thing. And the other side is cinematic, which is where I generally work, where the engagement is a little bit more psychological. Um, so Henry, uh, which is made by my friend Sashka at Oculus, uh, he, uh, his stuff is generally more positional. So basically, you experience this thing in a DK2, or you know, obviously, whatever else they're making. Um, and you can like look over, look around. And it's, it's a little bit more of like a move around in the experience thing. Uh, and the thing that you saw, which is World Tour, which I, which I made, uh, is what we call 3 doff, which is you can rotate, you can look up and down, and you can slightly tilt. Not a whole lot, but you can tilt a little bit. Um, so creating and capturing, uh, it's basically a lot of GoPros or a lot of cameras in some regard. And so you can imagine the more GoPros you add, the more complicated it gets, but the more you know, you'll achieve something a little bit clearer, a little bit better. Um, so you basically have Mono 360, starting with a less amount of, uh, lesser amount of GoPros. You have uh, stereoscopic uh, 360 with the increase in GoPros. Uh, and, and one would argue one is less immersive, one is more immersive, one has a significantly easier playback, uh, the other one is a little bit more hardware intensive. And then you got cameras that look really neat and kind of like spaceships. Um, so ours is the Odyssey. Uh, GoPro is building it out for us. Uh, it's using the jump geometry. Um, we have Jaunt, who made a thing, uh, sorry, a camera called Neo, and Nokia made one called uh, Ozo. And I think Lytra originally, or sorry, just recently came out with their light field camera, or they at least announced it. It's not out yet, but um, positional VR. You basically build it in something like Unity um, or the Unreal Engine as well. Uh, I'm going through this really fast because the other part is actually, I think, a little bit more interesting than this. But um, and of course, spatial audio is a thing. We talk a lot about uh, cameras and headsets, but the microphone is a huge part. Audio is a very big part of this space. So designing audio for VR is something that a lot of us have been, have been thinking about. Um, this is Chris Milk's interesting mic head rig uh, that he used for a couple of projects that he did uh, at Verse. Um, so what do you do when you capture all that stuff? You do stitching, and stitching is basically when you take these uh, 16 cameras and uh, puts it together. I mean, it depends on how many cameras you have, so the different footage gets, basically gets lined up. So those are the different feeds from different cameras. Um, and I think you can see it, yeah, you can see him walking, great. Um, so this is my friend Tom from uh, YouTube, and this is an example of a bad stitch where uh, basically these stitch lines, if you walk 
uh, into them, through them, past them. If anything falls in a stitch line, you generally get that kind of weirdness. Um, and a lot of experiences you see now, you'll definitely notice stitch lines. If you notice somebody walking around the rig, you'll see like occasional little hiccups. Um, and that's just uh, a result of basically someone meticulously trying to get the stitch lines out and probably not doing a very good job of it. Um, but anyway, this is what Jump does and what you guys saw, which is it uses, uh, it algorithmically puts it all together. So it uses computer vision um, and uses uh, Google's computing power and basically puts it all together as, as, uh, as such. So viewing, um, the basics of a, of a, of a uh, VR headset, uh, is kind of, you have these eyes, right? Uh, you have lenses and you have a screen. And basically what we realized was that the technology to be able to, to immerse someone in a space was really on your phone, right? It was the ability that you could like actually turn around, your phone would know exactly, like positionally where you were. And the real thing that you needed uh, was, were these lenses uh, between you and the screen to give you enough distance so that you would uh, be able to, to view something uh, appropriately. So HMD examples. Um, the Samsung Gear, which I'm sure you guys have seen, maybe some of you haven't, but uh, we have cardboard, um, and then we have, we've open source cardboard, so we actually released the Viewmaster, which is really cool, right? So now you can actually have like the childhood Viewmaster and, and go to all these different places, uh, have fun there. Positional, uh, you basically have uh, the Vive and Oculus uh, with, their, uh, with their Rift design, so you can see stuff there. You can have really crazy looking wands to interact with stuff. And now the pain points. <laughs> it takes forever to stitch. So you could film as much as you want, but know that you'll probably be in an edit room working on stitch lines for a good amount of your time. So it's not, not great. Um, this was at Comic-Con, and if any of you know Nathan Fillion, he's right there. And uh, he got too close to the rig. So uh, if you can imagine, okay, if you hold up your hand, right, there's no, there's no, basically you can't rack focus in VR. So if I put my hand here, you're all in focus, but my hand's out of focus. But I can choose then to um, focus on my hand and then have you guys out of focus. And that's sort of how things happen. But because everything is in focus, you're getting this kind of weird proximity effect, which is what Nathan does to destroy the clip. Um, so, uh, by the way, I did not plan that. I think I won Comic-Con because Nathan Fillion showed up. I was told that I did, so I'm very excited about that. Um, the other thing, too, is it's, there's no re real easy way to handle spatial audio. So the idea is that uh, ideally what you'd want is audio that gets piped in, and you can basically go like this, and the audio tracks with your head motion. Um, it's a completely awesome experience when it works. Um, and it's kind of weird when it's just visual and no audio anyway. So we're all trying to figure out what the best way is to, to deal with audio in this space and, and help mix and create it. Um, this is really interesting. So uh, Toy Story 3, um, playbacks 24 frames per second, pre-rendered content. The render time to make one frame is 11 hours. In VR, you need to have real-time rendering, and the playback is 90 frames per second, and you need one frame every 11 milliseconds. That's insane. But that's the sort of struggle that uh, poor Sashka has to deal with. And that's why he has to lug around a really large computer and put in a really, you know, have the, the, his headset basically plugged in with a bunch of wires. Um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and phones just aren't good enough yet. So right now, we can see things in 2K, and it plays back fine. Uh, 4K is like the baseline. Ideally, and I, and I showed you guys this earlier, I mean, I have 8K adaptive playback stuff. So it's basically, you can, like, the clarity in the, in the, is really important. If you, can't, if you see pixels, if you see pixels on the phone, you see pixels on the, on the like, by, by you know, compression artifacts and things of that sort, it just totally takes you out. You're like, oh, I'm watching something on a phone. So it's a little, it's a, it's a pain point. And, the, and this, to me, is the most important thing. There's not a lot of good content. There just isn't, because no one has, you know, no one wants to do the stitching. The rigs aren't really widely available, um, and it's just something that people are just starting to make now and start to get really into. That's why you guys are here, I imagine, is that you want to learn more about how to make stuff. So content, uh, and this is basically it. Once the pain points of the equipment disappears and the gimmick has worn off, all you're going to have is content. And here's a here's a traditional bias. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call this a flatty. 
but basically it's a frame. You see stuff in a frame, you see stories in the frame. It's basically a box with stuff in it. Beautiful boxes, but a box. And what we do is we stick it in a 360 environment, and then we put a person in there, and then we have them uh, engage with it. But see what happens there is that um, we think that just by taking what we're used to seeing and putting it in a 360 environment, we then made a really amazing VR experience. And it couldn't be more wrong. Um, because of the fact that all I need to do is uh, look somewhere and go like this, and it's terrible. So if you think about VR as like a, because you know, Google math, I don't know, but 360 visual plus human plus engagement, and the quality of VR is the strength of the 360 visual plus respect to the human plus predicting the engagement. So that's almost like quality equals strength, acknowledgement and understanding. Um, so going back to the rock band performing at a concert scenario, um, put a rock band into a location, put a person in the location looking at the rock band, and that person uh, starts to engage with the environment. And the reality is it's just not the best experience you could give to somebody. You're basically saying, come into this experience with me, but um, I don't care about the other stuff that you might look at. I just care about this one thing that I want you to look at. And we're starting to get away from that now. So creating the universe. So I'm going to talk about rocks. Um, since the dawn of time, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, attempted many ways to represent rocks visually through drawings, photos, paintings, etc. Uh, we've uh, did a lot of things to make them look half decent. Uh, thanks to Getty Images for letting me pull off their website some really cool rock photos. Um, you know, the majestic ocean rock, you know, piles of rocks, pushing rocks up of ledges, uh, wedding rocks. Uh, and, and the reality is rocks have never really been that interesting to look at visually, right? But we found, uh, when I went, I filmed in Iceland, and I found that uh, VR rocks are awesome. It was actually better than most of the stuff we shot, which isn't to say that we didn't shoot some good stuff. We did. I'm just saying the rocks was actually shockingly really good. Um, and that, you know, what the heck's going on here? And there, there's two real things. One is context. It's not about, it's about everything. It's not about the thing, it's about the things around the thing. So it's everything. It's how the whole thing is designed. Um, and redefining meaningful experiences. What we've known to be interesting when directed to it may not be as interesting as what we experience when we are given the capacity to look around. So interesting is totally not the same as it was. Um, so I went to Paris. Whoop. Come on. And uh, I watched these kids uh, play soccer. I think you'll see in a second. And what was really cool about this experience was that these kids actually ended up um, revealing something really interesting about the experience, which is like it's more, it's less about the, the directness of the thing, the flatness of a space. It's more about the layers of experience that happen in a space. Uh, so, uh, let's take this rock band scenario again. So that's one way to think about it, which obviously doesn't work very well. And it's actually something more like that. So these different, like these multiple layers of, of, uh, of movement. Um, and, uh, you know, first layer being location. So the best places aren't always the ones you would expect, and sometimes you're we're wrong about it. So of course, because it's like 360 and it's really cool, like, you know, basketball, okay. So we go and we film basketball, but it turns out the most interesting part of the basketball game wasn't so much the game itself, but it was, oh, that didn't show up, there you go. Um, so we filmed a bunch of stuff at uh, this uh, WNBA All-Star game. And uh, what was interesting, and I don't think we'll get to it till the end, because of course we put it at the end, but uh, it's the locker room scene with, was like when the coach does a pep talk, was far more interesting than the game. And so that's huge. Like, you know, having a meeting with, you know, the NBA and them saying, I love that last shot. Completely forgetting that the whole point of us being there was to film this game. 
Um, Star Spangled Banner was really interesting too. We'll get to that in a second as well. But basically in the location you have two, two things to think about. One is um, there's access, right? It's like I'm, on, I'm, on a, I'm at a game, I'm on Mars, this is great. And it's more about always wanting to be there and finally having the capacity to go there. The second uh, thing you can choose to do in a location is enrichment. I don't know where I am, but I'd love to figure it out. So basically like the, the soccer game, where I'm basically just dropped into a space being like, OK, like what, what about this is important to me? What, where can I, how can I piece it together into something meaningful? Um, which gets us to movement. So the first layer is like location, right? I'm in Paris, if we want to like break that down. I'm in Paris, and around me, kids are playing soccer. So to me, the movement actually makes me accept the experience that I'm in. I'm actually fully immersed based on that. Or it could be a lack of movement, which makes me evaluate the experience. I actually, if there's nothing move, moving, I'm going to actually stop and actually look around to see specifically what's going on. Like, OK, nothing's happening. What am I doing? Um, this was in Iceland. Again, Iceland. Uh, and there's nothing happening. But I am attracted to that plane because that's all that's in the space. And I believe you should see like a man walking. Oh, I shouldn't have revealed that too soon. Uh, but basically, I'm able to, to identify spots within a space because there's no movement and focus my attention on that and let a story sort of emerge from those points that I'm looking at. And then, of course, story, which is the third layer. Story is really about the uh, experiential kind of breadcrumbs, the clues, the characters, um, the things around a space that uh, give me a better sense of what the, what the situation is. And we start getting to narrative based on, based on that stuff. Um, so here's a thing that's been really interesting. We, it's the same thing as the flatty scenario. We're like, OK, we're going to take what we are used to doing in a frame, and we're going to put in a VR experience. It's going to be great. We don't really think about the camera as a person. We think about a camera as a portal to get what, you know, what we'd like to communicate to somebody out there. But now we're at a point where someone has the agency to look around. It's basically like you're taking a person being like, here you go. Here you go. Like you're raising, making them taller, making them shorter, putting them in different positions. So really, the camera is a person. And whatever happens psychologically in that space, or whatever happens in that space, will psychologically affect that person that's watching it. So basically, whatever's happening in that room to that camera is going to affect somebody. But not from like a person to machine level. It's like a person to a person level. So a lot of things to think about is you know, setting the right height, you know, setting the right distance. There's too many words, so I'm just going to go through this real quick. And accounting for stereo. This is the part that's going to piss a lot of you off, or just make you feel a little uncomfortable. It, it made me really feel uncomfortable. So uh, uh, I did this uh, music video with a violinist. Uh, and you, I don't know if you can see it. It's probably out the side. But the idea is that we're so used to like, OK, I have, I have two things here. Like, here's the table. I know I have a line that I can't leave. But I'm, I'm going to stand right here at the table. It's going to be beautifully composed. Awesome. In VR, this is more interesting. Having to psychologically deal with another thing in front of a person is actually a better experience for somebody because they actually have to like basically fight another layer to get to you. So compositionally, being in the center is fine, but being sort of in between all this stuff, like the messier the framing of it, the messier the composition, the better. A messy room is better than a clean room. So any sort of OCD tendencies that you have, just forget it. Because <laughs> it, I mean, you, you again, Totally works fine, but the format itself and the media itself uh, thrives in mess and thrives in chaos. Uh, and movement of the rig is always a big thing. Everyone's always like, should I put it on a drone? Can I move it around with a car? <laughs> Can I put it on a horse? Uh, no. I mean, you could, but people generally throw up, so there's that. Um, and uh, it's so constant velocity is fine. Uh, but it's sort of, so in the film that I showed you, there's a tram shot, right? And the tram is designed by a person that knows that he or she is going to transport people up a mountain. So it's not going to go fast, it's not going to accelerate or decelerate, it's not going to try to make a person sick, it's going to try to make the person feel comfortable. So in a, in a situation like that, putting a rig there, elevators, great. So anything that sort of has that kind of um, uh, mechanics is great. But as you know, probably from being in cars before, if you're like reading or, or on your phone or something, and all of a sudden you, uh, 
you know, you're accelerating, decelerating as you're trying to focus on something, it, it really affects you. Um, and uh, the same happens in VR as well. Uh, I worked with the BBC uh, on uh, just some tests in Monterey. And the, you can't really tell because, but you can see how it's sort of, this is a steady cam example. Do you see kind of how it's kind of doing this? That makes me feel so sick. Like I, I can't, I can't even see it now. But basically if you're in there, you're kind of doing this like rocky motion here. And it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, uh, learnings from this thing, uh, it's, it's an anechoic chamber. I don't, think, I don't think I'm saying that right, but. Uh, and basically what it does is it, uh, it's a soundproof, they, they test antennas there and you can see it's sort of spinning around there. Uh, and also, if you're moving and you're trying to focus on something, uh, it also, I mean, again, it's like car sickness. You can't really, you can't really register it. It makes you feel very sick. Um, although, and I will say this, you can use that to your advantage uh, if you wanted to. So say, for instance, there's a moment where you want someone to feel really uncomfortable. Maybe there's a point you want them to take to where, I mean, the artistry in, in this is more about the, um, taking sort of the weirdnesses of the format and really playing to those weirdnesses as well. Uh, so here you go. Um, psychological engagement. Um, how do you deal with someone psychologically in a space? So um, we have a welcome mat idea, which the rocks actually help to uh, portray. So when you get into an experience, I wish I could spend like a whole day with you guys because it could be really, it gets really deep. But um, uh, when you enter an experience, generally you don't want someone to immediately, like people aren't going to know what to do. People are going to go to an experience and be like, I just put on cardboard, I just put up, like, I just turned this experience on, I don't know what's going on. And so uh, something that we've done uh, is use rocks to, uh, to show, um, to allow a person to settle into an experience. Uh, in terms of introducing characters, traditionally what you do, um, is uh, similar to the rock band idea where it's like, okay, Clint Eastwood shows up, I see Clint Eastwood, he's my hero, that's awesome, let's go. Um, and it's the same thing as the rock band, where you're basically just doing the same thing that we've been doing traditionally forever. So what about something like that? Where discovering elements of the story is actually far more interesting to someone than having them presented to that person. So the person actually looks for the hero. The hero is discovered in that, in that uh, scenario. It's Paris again. I'm going to skip this, but um, you actually see the guy with the cart uh, all the way to the left there. And if you can imagine a situation like this, where uh, you, have a, you, know, you have your layers of experience, and then within that, there are these people that emerge that become your heroes, or the villain, or the bystanders. Um, having the meaning actually emerge from the experience versus, <laughs> versus, uh, versus the latter. And rebellion is huge. A lot of the things that we've learned about uh, in, this, in this world is a lot based on, the, on uh, computer games or video games, right? Um, where you know, for whatever reason, I may not want to look where you're telling me to look. Like, I might see someone and be like, I know that's the story, but, you know, screw you, and then look the other direction. Um, and in that, if that's the case, then I want to be able to actually introduce something on the opposite end for someone, so that then when they turn, they see it. It could be another, you know, character, it could be a sub-story, it could be a guy eating a cheeseburger, it doesn't matter, but it's just the idea that you have given them the agency to look around and that there's a payoff for doing that is actually really big. So um, this is an example of that. I'm actually standing behind the rig. That was by accident. But I mean, if you turn around and you're not looking the direction that uh, I want you to, you get to see me whether or not that's interesting or not, I don't know. Um, and the other thing too is something like this where I, uh, I, this is kind of embarrassing, but I'll show it. It's in the film. Um, the <laughs> So the idea is like I, so I, I could have just done it where I like put the put myself being a klutz in the center and you saw that no matter what, but there's something to to be said about catching stuff, right? So like you know I, instead of instead of you seeing me be a klutz, you kind of at the corner of your eye I can place and design it such that I can place it there that that person there and then you just basically look, and it makes for a much more meaningful experience for for someone. I mean it makes me look like an idiot, but I'm fine with that too. Um, and identity is really big in this space too. So traditionally, when we want someone to feel connected to somebody else, we do this. 
close up of the eyes, close up of the face, get connected with the person. If you do it in a VR space, it is the freakiest thing. You're basically in, like, there's this thing next to you, and you can't, like, you, you can't smell them, but you can't, you know, there's all these other things that actually happen to you psychologically when you're close to a person. So this is actually pretty bad uh, form. This ends up being more interesting. Because you're kind of wondering, well, why is that person there? Like, a person that doesn't need, like, if you imagine, like, right now I'm talking to you, if I just did this and, like, started working, there's, there's a mystery to it. Like, why, why, is, why is she turning around? Like, what's going on? And I think that that actually helps to engage someone a little bit more. And they, there's this want of connection versus, again, the presentation of trying to connect someone to something. And then you can also feel loneliness when that person goes away. Same with eye contact. You know, it's fine. But shared experience is better. This is like the Star Spogel banner where everyone's standing up, or any sort of you know, game in the beginning, everyone's standing up looking at a person singing, and you feel like you're, you're in this collective experience with somebody, and that actually resonates and is pretty powerful. So, n people have been saying for a while that you can't edit in VR, which is um, not true, and it's weird that people would say that knowing that no one's really been making a whole lot of VR. Um, so, traditionally, again, this is how we think of editing now. It's uh, you know clip to clip, frame to frame. Where in VR, we really need to start looking at it. Whoop. Hold on. Like that. These worlds of experience that basically build on top of each other. And really what you're trying to do, like a drop in a bucket, is you're trying to, like, you're trying to rotate these worlds. I'm talking more about montage here, but you're basically trying to rotate these worlds so that psychologically I can be in one space, and that leads to the next experience psychologically that matches with that and so on. So I called it, because there's no terms for anything, probabilistic experiential editing, which has a really unfortunate acronym. <laughs> and uh, uh, working on that. Um, there's someone at MIT who was, who was really awesome, because I guess people at MIT, when you do talks with them, they're like immediately trying to figure out how to solve all my issues. And they're like, well, like there's, a, there's one that's C, there's one that's peer. I just keep it, I don't, I don't know, whatever. Um, so the idea is that uh, you know, these are points of interest. So if, if I'm in a space, if I'm in an experience, there are things I can look at. In some cases, there are, it's more about the experience. So right now, I'm in like a, the back to the rocks thing again. Um, and, you know, I'm, I can kind of look anywhere, and I can't really gauge where someone's going to look specifically. So maybe I'm looking over here. But in a scene like this, they may start somewhere, but I know that they may end up here. And in the tram, I imagine they're probably going to be looking at one of the windows. I don't know anything for sure but I can make a pretty good guess. So basically, what I can do from there is take these scenarios, understanding where someone enters an experience and where someone e uh, exits that experience, and then I basically just rotate, basically make a kind of shoots and ladders situation to psychologically engage someone and guide them through an experience. And then I can take uh, you know, ideas like you know, matches on attention if I'm looking at a particular part of the frame. Uh, oops, sorry. So I know they're looking at that guy. And then I can cut to something that I think is important, like her. Or this idea, and this is sort of game-like too, where if I'm in an experience, and, f and for this, it was more about um, the windows. I can actually use the windows to psychologically, to think about psychologically what a person's going through. So when we, look at, when we look at a window, we're not really looking at a window, we're looking through a window at something else. So what I can do is um, extend or reply to that. I don't know if this is actually gonna. So I look out the window there, and I can meet you with a horse face, or the one before that, where I can extend someone's gaze by cutting from a window to looking down the corridor of the horse stable instead. Uh, and the Discover Moments thing we talked about as well. And the last thing I want to talk about 
is this idea of home, which I think uh, the keynote speaker also talked about, where um, a lot of the things that we've been thinking about um, have been these really big major events. Um, and there's something really remarkable about going to someone's house. Um, I do a lot of traveling. I, I don't get to see my parents that often, and maybe this makes me sound like a softie, but I really like, I like hanging out with my mom. So what's really cool, and my dog. I have a really cool dog, sorry. Um, so uh, something that I learned from being at home, you can see my dog, actually. I'm wearing really cheap, like, ignore the pink pants. That's like a back in the day kind of thing. But um, is that these intimate moments are actually what's going to make VR really awesome, where you can actually go to someone's house and be around a family, and um, you know, inviting someone into to a place that you live or you work, um, and that kind of transferring of ideas and that engagement will be really, really uh, cool. So that was a lot of stuff. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we're all sort of learning this together, and um, there's a lot. So um, you know that that, but that's it for me. And uh, so thank you. Um, and. Anyone have any questions?